Dr. Fizz, theoretical physics, we're going to show all of our techniques to get the Green's function for the low pass filter from scratch. Now we know the answer is e to the minus t for the unshifted Green's function. And that e to the minus t gets convolved with the general f of t that's applied to the circuit. And this convolution here is our general solution but we're going to pretend we don't know this. That we start with the differential equation, the voltage between the ground and the left side of the resistor, the Vn, is equal to IR plus Q over C, and with one ohm and one farad, we simply have the derivative of Q at respect to T plus Q. So we're going to solve this differential equation using our Green's function the method and we'll get this Green's function here, the unshifted one, and then when you shift it here by letting t be t minus u, then you have your general solution, as we talked about earlier. Well, step one, the Dirac delta function. You take the differential equation here, no Vn. The Vn is special. It's going to be our smack, the spike of the Dirac delta function. And then step two, take the Fourier transform. And the Fourier transform of the left side is, well, you have the Fourier transform of the derivative, which is I omega times the Fourier transform of the function Q. So it's capital Q times I omega. And the Fourier transform of the little Q is simply big Q. What about the Fourier transform of the direct delta function? Well, if uh, you have a direct delta function here instead of that Q, you then have the sifting property and it's going to be e to the zeroth power which is 1 and what survives is 1 over the square root of 2 pi. We then factor out the q and we get i omega plus 1 and we have solved our algebraic equation in the transform space. That was the idea of the transform to melt differential equation into an algebraic one, solve it instantly or very very quickly and now it's time to get back and we get back by making our own key no tables to look anything up we're going to get back on our own by taking the inverse for a transform and that's step three complex integration techniques so let's do that and we see that we have the uh, inverse Fourier transform is to use the e to the plus i omega t and simply insert this function here into the for the q and notice that you'll get a 1 over 2 pi and you'll have simply the integral of the 1 over 1 plus i omega with this exponential e to the i omega t and you integrate over omega we're doing the inverse Fourier transform to get back and then we look at this as a candidate for complex integration, we promote the omega to the complex plane, the variable z, and by doing that we replace omega with z in the three places, and I multiply here top and bottom by minus i so that down here minus i times i z is simply z and then minus i times 1 is minus i. So I see that nice z there, and step one in doing the complex contour integration is to identify those poles. So we identify one pole here, z equal to i, and then this next step is to know where to close the deal. Do you close it above or do you close it below? Well here the guide is the e to the i z t. When the semicircle is at, say, we're at this top point, then the z is purely imaginary, i times r, the radius, and when i times r goes in for that z, we see that we get i squared, which is the minus sign here, which is nice, because then as r goes to infinity, this gets goes to zero. And notice that t is greater than zero, since we hit the thing with the Dirac delta function at t equals zero, and we're interested in times as the system evolves, you know, as t go, you know, is greater than zero, in the future in other words. So it all works out good. And then uh, we use the residue theorem to get the result, which is 2 pi i times the residue of the integrand. Notice that 
the factor out in front is here, minus i over 2 pi. And for the residue, for the single pole, you simply clear the denominator for that pole. There's only one there, so it's gone. And then you put in z equal i for everything else. Notice all the cancellations here. It's amazing. 2 pi canceled, and then minus i times i is 1. Wow, all that went away. And then I just simply have e to the i z t evaluate z equals i, and that's i squared t. That's minus t. That's it. That's the Green's function. We did it. We knew that was the answer, and we got it using our techniques. Well, let's look at this a little more carefully, because what I am worried about here is we don't have a z squared down here like we did before when we used the z equal r e i theta trick. Because see then we wound up with an r squared down there and we had an r coming from the dz here and the r here and the r squared left a 1 over r. And then I just worried about the exponential not messing me up. But here I have an r and an r. When r gets larger and larger, see, those r's will cancel, and I'll have nothing but that exponential. So I'm a little bit concerned. I need to rely on this exponential a little bit more. So let's look at this. If I put in z up here, then you have i, r, and then e d i theta. I write it out, cosine theta plus i sine theta, and then there's t on the far right. Now notice when the i hits the cosine of theta, that's not anything to worry about since e to the i anything up here, some alpha is going to be cosine alpha plus you know, sine i sine alpha, and they're not going to blow up. When the i hits the i here, I get the minus r, and then I have the sine of theta, and t, t is greater than zero, so I'm good. And then when r goes to infinity, I'm going to get this integral to be 0. Now you might be a little worried about theta equal to 0 and theta equal to pi since the sine of theta of those cases will be 0 and then if you evaluated that and the, then took the limit later for the r you'd have, wait a minute, you'd have, uh, you'd have you'd have 1 here, and then if you took r, in other words, you get into a confusing situation here, infinity and 0. So here's what we'll say about that. The limits here, 0 and pi, are on the x-axis, and I need those points in my regular integral. So really, the extraneous part, the semicircle, begins at some epsilon away from the axis. So if the theta is some epsilon, well then the sine of theta will not be zero, then the r going to infinity takes care of everything. So we're all set. We're good. Step four, the Green's function. There it is, e to the minus t. And the shifted Green's function here, e to the minus, you know, the t gets replaced with t minus u, and there is our general solution. Some authors prefer to write this u as a t prime, and the t prime is your past. It's when the operations of that f of t were at work, and then you integrate over your past to get to your present. And that's a really neat way to see how the Green's function works with this function f of t. So what we did here is we had a differential equation and we actually did do a direct solution uh, since this uh, low pass filter could be solved uh, many ways. And here we practice our technique with the Fourier transform when you have your direct delta function as your impulse, solve your algebraic equation, come down here to the algebraic solution step and then do the inverse Fourier transformation here, inverse Fourier transform to get back to regular space, that's our key using complex integration techniques, and get your Green's function. When you have a function of x, the convention is to use k for the transform space, and when you have the function of t like we had, we use omega.